I'm not anti-medication. Uh, I should say that first. You know, when medications work, I am all for them. And people in the drug industry, you know, I know many of these scientists and researchers, they're desperately trying to help people with diseases and do good by creating these drugs. The simple fact is that none of the sleep drugs that we currently have produce naturalistic sleep. Again, they're a class of drugs, almost like alcohol. They're called the sedative hypnotics. So again, what you're really doing is just knocking out the cortex of the brain. And if I were to look at the electrical signature of your sleep when you're on these sleeping medications, it's not the same as natural sleep. So that's the first thing. That perhaps wouldn't be so bad if it didn't come with deleterious consequences, and there are many. Firstly, what we've realized is that sleeping pills have been associated with a significantly higher risk of death. And it's quite large too, and one of the studies I review is one of the largest where they looked at 10,000 people who were taking sleeping pills of a variety of types relative to 20,000 very well-matched controls. And they looked at them across a, just a two and a half year period. And what they found is that people taking sleeping pills were about four times more likely to die across that two and a half year period than those who weren't taking sleeping pills. And what was striking is that it didn't take much. Even people who were just taking maybe 10 or 15 sleeping pills per year still had about a two to three percent, uh, sorry, two to three times higher risk of dying. Just dying from any circumstance. Yeah, they didn't necessarily try to sort of break down in that study what was deathly, they just had the mortality records. Okay. But we've since done a little bit more digging and what we've discovered firstly is that sleeping pills are associated with a significantly higher risk of developing cancer, as well as infection, that's the other thing. Wow, that's counterintuitive. Now, I think, you know, it's important to put in place here that right now those, those studies are simply associational. What we mean is that they're just correlational. We can't necessarily, necessarily say that it's causal right now. And let me just play the other side of the table for a second. It's possible that those people who've been struggling with sleep all their lives, who are now the people who are taking more sleeping pills, are simply dying earlier because of the poor sleep that they've been having before they ever started taking those sleeping pills. So it's the lack of sleep beforehand that's so deathly. And the sleeping pills is just a correlate of how bad their sleeping problems were. And it looks like the sleeping pills are the cause. Yeah. That's possible too. Same way with cancer, because we know a lack of sleep is so related to cancer. However, it's equally possible that sleeping pills are deathly and carcinogenic. And if you look at some of the animal studies that are uploaded to the FDA website, you actually see some of that carcinogenic impact with sleeping pills too, and that information is not out there. So all of which is to say, people should know that information about sleeping pills if they're taking them. Oftentimes doctors aren't aware of it. Doctors, by the way, this is something else I spoke about in the Lancet article, it's not really their fault that they're not more sleep proactive with their patients. Doctors on average in their medical curriculum, and I surveyed them, get only about two hours of sleep education. A third of their patients' lives are spent sleeping, but they only get two hours of two sleep hours, education. Two hours, about as much time, right? <laughs> striking, you know, as a conversation. But so doctors aren't necessarily aware of the consequences of sleeping pills. What's important to know is that they don't need to be the first line treatment. There is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or CBTI, and you work with the therapist, it has been shown to be just as effective as sleeping pills in the short term in terms of its benefit for sleep. But better still, unlike sleeping pills, when you stop working with that therapist, you continue to gain the benefits. You continue to sleep well. In fact, a recent study demonstrated that those sleep benefits are still seen 10 years later. Okay. With sleeping pills, one of the other problems is that you stop using them. And not only do you go back to the bad sleep that you were having before, but your sleep is often worse. It's called rebound insomnia when you stop taking those drugs. So now you have to start taking more of those sleeping pills to get back to where you were. So you can develop tolerance and then you have daytime sleepiness. You sort of get sort of groggy during the day. So my opinion right now is that if we were to come up with a sleeping medication that I think is efficacious, efficacious, beneficial, doesn't have health consequences and produces naturalistic sleep, I would be a very vocal advocate of it. Right now it's not. And you're right, you know, in the last month, 10 million people, at least in America, have swallowed some kind of sleeping pill in, uh, in that time period, which I think speaks to this desperate need yeah. for sleep. Um, and to 
you know, put the statistics in place, it's a remarkable money maker. Um, you know, I joke in, in the book that it took George Lucas, I think, about 40 years to build up about four billion in profit revenue from uh, the Star Wars franchise. 40 years, 30 years. Um, it took Ambien about 22 months to amass four billion in profit. That's how desperate I think our hunger for sleep is and how problematic sleep is in society. I think that's one of the other reasons that the book took off. I think it's this lack of knowledge and science not being communicated together with this global sleep loss epidemic that has happened over the past hundred years and the escalation of disease that's associated with that lack of sleep. There's this perfect storm. You know, um, we knew more and more about sleep and we saw sleep having this great depression in society over, you know, these decades. And I think that's why the book, it, it, the time for the book was right. It, and I was just very lucky.